First, thank you, Catherine, for bringing me here again. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Oscar. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about the origins of this project. And I think I will use, uh, as probably way too many people do these days, uh, Brett Kavanaugh to say something about it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you watched some of the early parts of the uh, hearings when he was sa sailing along just fine and, and uh, talking very freely about his life and his beliefs about the, uh, his job as a, as a judge and uh, cases he believed in and all that stuff. And one of the things he said over and over and over again was how important the rule of law is, as though um, that was you know, one of the guiding principles. And of course, it should be. Um, I was a little skeptical when you think of some of the laws that um, you know, he has supported. I, it seems to me that um, actually much more important than, in, for all of us these days is somebody who is more concerned about the rule of justice than the rule of law and the rule of making the rule of law uh, adhere more closely to um, a sense of justice. But while he was talking, I, this, this gets to the first kind of thing that Oscar was talking about, is the mythos of this country and how dangerous it can be to actually to the survival of all of us. Because, I mean, we talk about the rule of law, meaning legal, you know, legalisms, and then we talk about, um, say, the laws of economics and how important that is. And we talk about economics as though it, find, it is the basis of our lives, and it is for many people. And we talk about other kinds of laws and other aspects of our society. What we talk, don't talk about is the most important law of all, which is the law of nature, which our lives all depend on. And, you know, if we don't work exceedingly hard uh, in the next few years to try to bring our institutions into accordance with the laws of nature. Um, all these other laws don't matter at all. You know, it's going to be, uh, we'll be in a very, very bad position. Uh, the first time I really thought about that was right here. Uh, I don't know if it was in this room, but it was at this university. I had, had a show of these portraits, I think it was about eight years ago at Art Rage downtown. And uh, I, at, the, at that point, I asked for people in the audience to suggest somebody local that um, I could paint that would be a good subject. A whole bunch of hands went up and said, Oren Lyons. Oren Lyons, you've got to paint Oren Lyons. How many in this room know who Oren Lyons is? A few people. Well, for those of you who don't, he's the, the faith keeper. He's now in his late 80s. He's the faith keeper of the Onondaga tribe and uh, has been involved in uh, civil rights, indigenous rights, all kinds of rights for a long time. And when I met him, one of the first things he said to me was, we knew, when he was, it was like native people forever, you know, a thousand years ago, native people now, native people a thousand years in the future. We knew when you separated church and state, it would only lead to disaster. You know, I looked at him, what are you talking about? What a crazy thing to say, it seemed. Uh, isn't that really important to the foundation of, of a secular society? And he said, no, you don't understand what I mean. He said, when you separated the responsibility of your institutions to be in harmony with nature, you had separated yourselves from the reality of your own lives. And he said, your deepest spirituality has got to come from your deepest reality. Everybody's deepest reality is nature. And you've got to honor that and, and live in accordance with that. And he said, for us as Native people, nature is our church. And what you had affected, what you had done is separated yourselves from the church of nature. I mean, all this other separation doesn't really matter, according to him, in a, in a certain sense. Unless you're in relationship with that church, um, you're not going to survive on this planet, as he said. It would only lead to disaster. 
very interesting thing. And we can see how that's happening right now. I and mean, it's been happening for years and years in terms of pollution, habitat loss, and everything else. But now we've got climate change you know, coming at us uh, really quick. And <coughs> even you know, climate scientists who are uh, still hopeful about how we're going to adapt to this are saying that probably no matter how much we try to change in the next you know, 20, 30 years, the planet is probably going to reach three centigrade above um, the uh, the point at, at you know where we are now, basically two more degrees from where we are now. That's the point of climate chaos. By ending the use of fossil fuels, we can begin to come down or not come down from there. But is that enough? I mean, by that time, with all that chaos, um, this a very this planet will be a very different place to live in or on. So I just want to start, when I think about the rule of law these days, I always think first about the rule of nature, the laws of nature. That if we seem to think in, in you know, human arrogance that we can begin in a place that where it's our laws which we have to pay attention to, or our laws which we can manipulate to make you know, it possible to do all kinds of things that have nothing, no relationship to justice, but still call ourselves obeying the rule of law. You know, it, it, that, that is not helpful. Uh, we have to go to a, a whole different way of thinking about who we are. That brings me to, I want to say something about where this project came from. And a lot of you will remember this very clearly. In, uh, uh, in, 2000, um, in 2001, right after 9-11, actually within a few days of 9-11, our government at the time began talking about attacking the country of Iraq as a response to 9-11. As though you know, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, they were in league with Al-Qaeda, and um, you know, they had, uh, what was the other thing? They had weapons of mass destruction, that, uh, and they were involved in bringing down the, tire, the towers. None of those things was true. You know, none of those things was true. They knew none of those things was true. We were being lied to. That's not, not strange. I mean, governments lie. Everybody's government lies, sooner or later. Uh, or more often than not, sometimes. The problem is that we theoretically have a free press that is supposed to tell us when these things are going on. We don't really. And that was a, one of the most amazing proofs of it I've ever seen. What a corporate press does when it stands to gain from a government policy. They don't tell you the truth. They cheerlead for the government. And so, you know, some of us were waiting for the, uh, you know, the, the press to do its job, and they didn't. In terms of the rule of law, you know, we were, at that point, uh, you know, committing war crimes. The greatest crimes against humanity, the same ones at Nuremberg, that we use to prosecute Nazis, you know, preemptive war. We were doing that. And this was, you know, I don't want to dwell on that a long time, but just to say that, you know, eight years later, when President Obama came in, some of you remember the first thing he did was say he wasn't going to prosecute any of the people from the Bush administration, whether we're talking about torture, mass surveillance, or the crimes of the Iraq war. Nobody was going to be prosecuted because, um, you know, he didn't want to look backward. He wanted to look forward. I mean, this is a constitutional lawyer. I mean, what does the law do except look backward so it can look forward? So he says, we're not going to look backward. We're going to look forward in order to maintain, he said, our core principles. Well, I thought the rule of law was a core principle. And it was being you know, thrown under the bus. Um, not because of the rule of law, in a sense, but because the rule of law might be too disturbing, you know, to the social fabric. Well, isn't that what law is supposed to be? I mean, when you're doing something on that scale, but of course, maybe when you're doing something on that scale, that's precisely when uh, people are afraid to use it. I mean, think of the recession in 2008, you know, with all these bankers committing felonies, and what they do is they, they get their bonuses. Um, 
Anyway, that to me was the origin of this. I just thought at that moment, <clears throat> I can't stand living in this country and not being more fully engaged as a citizen. And I was so angry and full of grief about where we were going and all the victims there were going to be that I thought, I've got to surround myself with people who make me feel good about the country rather than obsess about the ones who don't. That I had to use that energy to do something positive. I felt I was actually killing myself with my anger. And um, it's been a lifesaver for me. I never expected that this would become a show that traveled all around and uh, gave me an opportunity to talk to people about all the issues that I'm allowed to talk about because of now all the people I painted. I don't know if, I don't know if you mentioned the show at the end of November, did you? No, I didn't. Um, by the way, Syracuse, on the last week of November, is going to show this entire collection. There are now about 240 paintings. Nobody's ever seen all these paintings, I mean, including me, in one place at one time. Uh, I can see them in racks in my basement, uh, but I've never seen them displayed all at one time. I want to thank Syracuse enormously uh, for this opportunity to you know, show all these paintings and also they're bringing a number of the people I painted here to talk. Uh, it will also on the 29th will be the uh, University Lecture Series night and I'll be sharing the stage with Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. Let's see, can I operate this? Who's operating the... Oh, go down to uh, uh, the H's. Well, actually, stop here for a second and uh, click on this guy. One of the people on the stage with me that night will be Richard Bowen. He was the chief risk assessment officer at Citigroup in 2008. In 2006, he went to his bosses there and said, hey guys, we got a little problem. 60% of the uh, mortgages we're acquiring that we're bundling into these funds and then reselling are worthless. This is not going to end well. And they ignored him. Two years later, he went directly to Robert Rubin himself, you know, chairman of the board, Citigroup, and said, Mr. Rubin, 80% of the mortgages we're acquiring are worthless. This is going to collapse. And the response then was to fire him. You may remember that um, in the 1980s, when we had the savings and loan crisis, $150 billion was lost out of the U.S. economy because of that crisis, and a thousand bankers were prosecuted and went to jail. A thousand bankers. It's estimated when you finally total up what was happened in 2008, it will amount to $24 trillion. And not one banker has gone to jail. $24 trillion of other people's money, which these guys were reimbursed for. The rule of law, you know, it's, anyway, he'll be here. He's a wonderful guy. He's a born-again Christian. He's a, um, he teaches now at the University of Texas at Dallas. He teaches a course in business ethics. He's uh, eminently qualified. Um, go down a little bit further. Go back to the portrait galleries and go down to the H's. Uh, keep going. Whoops, did we get, oh. Dr. Yeah, here we are. Now yeah, click on her. Anybody know who she is? Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. She's the pediatrician from Flint, Michigan, who blew the whistle on the lead in the water. She is dynamite as a person, and uh, just the, her concern for the health of children, for honesty in public government, for um, taking care of the future, is astounding. And she's also really high-spirited and good person. And she and I have done a number of events together. So she'll be here too. And so uh, Dick Owen and uh, Dr. Mona and I and uh, LaVonda Reed from here, who's in the provost's office, will all share the stage and talk about you know, the issues involved in the portraits in general and particularly in their work. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing that sometimes the health of a society uh, depends so much on a single person who is willing to risk an enormous amount to, for other people uh, to make sure that the, or try to make sure that the society 
uh, acts for the common good rather than the profit of a handful of people. And uh, I've painted now quite a few whistleblowers, and they are all as exemplary as, as these two. Uh, I want to say um, something about somebody else who will probably be here that week, which has to do a lot with what I was saying at the beginning about nature and nature's law. How many of you are aware of somebody named Kelsey Juliana? Anybody? You can actually find her in the J's somewhere. Uh, uh, I guess down the other way. Uh, here she is. So, uh, a few years ago, 21 um, teenagers, 21 teenagers sued the U.S. government. The case is called Juliana versus U.S. Under what's called the Public Trust Doctrine. I mean, because of the Public Trust Doctrine, we have things like the EPA, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. You know, the idea is basically that one of the foremost activities of anybody's government is to protect the future for its children and for other species, too, of course. Um, government is not doing that. You know, it's a Chinese hoax in, in, at this moment. Uh, so who's going to force the government to do it? These kids got together and decided to sue the government. They are being represented by an organization called our Children's Trust, pro bono. This case is going to open later this month, October 29th, in Eugene, the federal courthouse in Eugene, Oregon. I don't see where it could go except to the Supreme Court. Um, the government, our government, has tried many, many times now to block this case. All kinds of writs and stays and all sorts of stuff. The courts out there won't hear of it. They want this case to go forward. Um, and what they're asking is that the government, you know, uh, immediately form government environmental policies based on the science of climate change. Very simple thing in a way. But it will be a radical change in the systems that run this country. But it also is the only chance that we'll have some sort of uh, decent survival on the planet. Kelsey will hopefully be here that last week of, um, of November when the portraits are here. If you get a chance to meet her or hear her talk, uh, please do it. She is, well, she's very much like Dr. Mona. She's full of great, good energy and loves to communicate with everybody about um, how important this is and what's happening and what she's trying to do. But that's the kind of person I love finding uh, who's doing, uh, you know, things like that that, you know, more, most of the time, excuse me, the people I paint are not talked about in our media much. They're not talked about... Um, you know, uh, they're not interviewed on the news hour. They're not uh, even on NPR, most of them. You know, and often they're doing the most important things or the most, some of the most important work in the society and also taking great risks doing it. Um, I just wanted to say a brief thing about uh, sort of war and peace and how, you know, you may have noticed that, uh, and, I'll, and I'll stop and we can talk together. You may have noticed that in, even in moments like this when uh, there's an enormous amount of attention being paid to politics and who's going you know, to get the uh, up hand in Congress and the Senate um, you know, next month. And you know, there's a lot of, well, I mean, it, it's, it's important you know, that this is going on and that people are realizing how important this election might be. Um, one of the things that isn't talked about is uh, this country's militarism. Even Bernie Sanders, people like that, almost never talk about it. And here, you know, over 50% of our disposable income goes to basically what you might call our empire. You know, we have over a thousand bases around the world. The only country in the world is, has bases like that. I mean, I think if you took all the other countries in the world and tried to add up their foreign bases, you might be 30. You know, we have a thousand. Uh, this takes enormous wealth out of this country that could be used for education, infrastructure, social good, you know, on and on and on, environment. Um, and, and gives it to a system that I think is more and more clearly, you know, a self-sustaining cycle that operates for its own benefit. We aren't more secure often because of our military. We're actually made more insecure because of the military. 
And uh, we can talk about that more if you want. But one of the things that, well, let me tell you a little story. And then I want to say something about the Veterans Center being built here. I was asked to speak at a, as part of a group of people to talk about PTSD and the treatment of it at um, the JFK School at, at Harvard. And there were people from all over the country doing incredible programs in, in the treatment of PTSD, a lot of them art-based, you know, plays, writing, art, you know, visual arts, et cetera, and having some real success. And at the very end of it, the somebody, uh, head guy, and I can't remember who it was from the JFK school came in and with his flip chart and started writing down all the recommendations that we had coming out of this meeting for how to treat people. And uh, they came to me and I said, well, you know, really if the best thing you could do for your veterans to prevent this kind of thing is not have wars. They looked at me like I was an idiot. And he wouldn't even put it up on the board. He wouldn't even write down, no war, you know, <laughs> nothing. I thought, whoa, that's interesting. So a little while later, uh, we were going around again, and some people were talking more specifically about some of what they do. And there was a Marine there who'd been in Iraq. I mean, he was a mess himself. You could just tell he was all nerves. But he is dedicating his life to treating other soldiers with, with PTSD. So I was still thinking I need to give a message to this guy from the JFK school. And he, so I, I asked this Marine, I said, well, what happens when a Marine or a soldier with, who's suffering from PTSD <clears throat> finds out that the war that he's been asked to fight on, it has given him the problem he's gotten because of what he's witnessed or what he's done or what's happened to him, or whatever it is. You know, what happens then when uh, he finds out that his leaders who sent him to that war were lying about the reason for the war? What happens? And the guy sort of went berserk, not at me. But he said, you can't treat a person then. They're so full of grief and anger and shame that they can't be treated. I mean, you know that most U.S. soldiers now, the, the majority of U.S. soldiers don't die in combat. They die from suicide now. You know, this is because of that kind of thing. They understand that these systems, that these, these uh, things that they're asked to uh, defend are basically indefensible, morally. So when I was thinking, you know, I was walking the other day, just two day, yesterday, down by the site of this new center that's being built here. Um, wouldn't it be a good idea if right in the center of it, this National Center for uh, Vietnam Resource Center, there was a center for peace negotiation? For actually, you know, defusing the systems that is creating all these veterans. Why isn't that part of it? You know? I mean, I don't know who's funding this thing. I assume it's government and Pentagon money uh, in large part. And, you know, we all are taught in this country to always um, support the service of our veterans. And that isn't my argument. My argument is not with the vets. Uh, my argument is with the people who misuse them. Uh, Wendell Berry, let me say, let's end on one per person. Go back to the, and you go up to the bees, you know. There he is, right here. Some of you know Wendell Berry? Good. You've been raising your hand too often. <laughs> He's a farmer, and I did organic vegetable farming for 11 years, part-time, full-time. He's, he's a voice that's just an amazing essayist. He's an essayist, he's a poet, he's a novelist, and he's an organic farmer, and he's still alive on the, down on the, uh, the bottom of Kentucky, Port Royal, Kentucky. I don't think there's anybody in the world who, uh, maybe Vandana Shiva or a few people, who write as persuasively as he does about a land ethic how we have to be living in relation to the land if we want to survive. But he also is very concerned with all kinds of other of, you know, public things that, that, that impact how we treat the environment. So in um, uh, 1991, at the end of the first Gulf War, you know, the one where uh, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, he wrote an essay. And in the essay, the last line 
was the quote that I put on his painting. He said, the most alarming sign of the state of our society now is <clears throat> that, wait a second, the most alarming sign of the state of our society now is that our leaders have the courage to sacrifice the lives of young people in war, but not the courage to ask us to be less wasteful and less greedy. I was in a class here yesterday, and we talked about Wendell Berry, and I asked these kids, they were in a, it was a human rights class, and I asked them, well, what's he talking about? You know? I just said, well, you know, what are these two kinds of courage? What's, how, does it, how do they fit together here? And these kids said, well, it's pretty clear. They said, when you make your economy more important than anything else in your society, you're willing to sacrifice the lives of your own children to keep the economy going. And I think what um, we are in that place. One, I think one of the most egregious examples of that was, and this is the last thing I'll say, was um, in 2001, three days after, I think it was just three days, maybe it was five days, I don't remember. I just remember George W. Bush went to New York to commemorate the um, falling of the towers. And he was up on this stanchion with a bullhorn. I mean, behind him and around him, everything was still smoking. You know, human flesh was still burning. And in this little speech, and some of you will remember this, he advised Americans of how to deal with their grief. You know what he said? He said, go shopping. Seriously, he said, this has been, you know, this has been a horrible thing. We've all got this grief. Go shopping. He did. Go look it up. I mean, you can watch it. I mean, it's, in, it's absolutely amazing. And, and I'm sure most people looking at it thought, is that the most tasteless, insensitive thing that I've ever seen in my life? And that's what I thought at first. And then I read this quote from Wendell Berry. And I thought, well, what he's saying is exactly that. Exactly. He said, well, hey, folks, there's some bad stuff happened here, but we can't slow the economy down. You know, there's some people who just burned to a crisp right here, and I can still smell them, but man, go shopping. It'll take care of it, because we got to keep this economy going. It's a very scary, you know, when we allow ourselves to have our values driven by our, and our ethics, formulated from our economics, you know, rather than our morals, we're in big trouble, and we're in big trouble environmentally and economically and by any other measure you can mean when we start allowing our values to be driven by uh, something other than the values we think we believe in that make our lives meaningful. So I'm going to stop right there.